we can have someone else share. <clears throat> it's okay. Okay. Should Let me go. Ahead. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing, I'll, I can go ahead and take over. Um, so for this first session, um, our first session is going to be from 10 a.m. to 12.15. Um, so thank you so much for those of you who got here exactly at 10 or for those just coming in at 10.30. Thank you so much. Um, and then this first session will end at 12.15 and you'll have a 30-minute break after. I do want to go ahead and introduce um, Alfred Herrera. Um, he's not here currently. He's trying to get in. He's trying his best to get in, but he does send his um, welcome, and that he's really happy that y'all are here. Um, so he is the Assistant Dean for Academic Partnerships and Director of our Center for Community College Partner Partnerships um, program. So um, he is, you know, the, the who started it all. So I'm so happy to be able to introduce him. I also do want you all to meet um, the people that were behind this whole event. Um, so I really do want you to uh, meet the Power to the Parenting Transfer Student Experience Committee. Um, they're all here with us today. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with introductions. Um, we're all gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves, our name, title, hometown, and where we transfer from. So Nancy, if you can kick us off. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Nancy. Um, good morning. I'm really happy to be here. I am a transfer student, a parenting student, and I was a CCCP scholar back in 2017 doing the um, first parenting site that really made a huge impact on my life. I transferred from East LA College in 2018 and to UCLA, and I just graduated this summer. And I will be starting a master's program this coming August. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Nancy. And hi, everyone. My name is Perla Partida. I'm one of the coordinators for the Center for Community College Partnerships. I oversee LACC and Harbor. Um, I am from Baldwin Park and super proud of it. I am a transfer student, so I did transfer from um, Mount San Antonio College, um, which I'm really proud. And I know I saw some Mounties in the building, so hey, hey to you all. Um, and I'm a parenting student. I started with my daughter when she was four months year, uh, four months old at my community college. From there, we transferred together to UCLA. Um, and then we did it again uh, when I was doing my master's at USC. So she's been with me this whole journey. Um, she is now eight years old. So she's been through it all. Um, so welcome, welcome. And I'll hand it over to Zuleika. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for sharing space with us. My name is Suleika Bravo. I am currently um, one of the uh, Triple CP office staff. I uh, started my undergraduate career at Antel Valley College, where my daughter was about eight months old. And then after three years, I was able to transfer to UCLA. I am also a recent graduate. Um, I uh, graduated this year. And I am also going into my master's in education program this year at UCLA. So I'm really happy to be here and really happy um, just to share all the information we can to not only motivate you, but to let you know that we were in your spot and that we're here to support. So I'll pass it off to Chelly. Thank you, Suleika. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Buenos dias. I'm Chelly Gonzalez, Program Coordinator here at CCP, overseeing the East LA Partnership. So shout out to any Huskies in the room. Um, I was also a transfer student. I transferred from Santa Barbara City College to CLA. Um, and I'm just super excited to kick us kick off the summer webinar series, starting with our parenting webinar. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, it's truly great. Um, and I just look forward to an amazing day. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia Inez Lopez. Um, I am a junior transfer, but I'm going to be a senior this fall at UCLA. Um, I transferred from Los Angeles Valley College. I am a mother of two. My daughters are named Ariel and Aaliyah. Um, there are not enough words to sum up um, what exactly CCCP means for me. I did parenting site. So I was in your shoes in 2019, the summer of 2019. And it was then that like a seed was planted and it was a dream that has come true. And I'm now at UCLA and I'm, it's a very full circle moment for me to be able to be here with all of you and helping you guys get the resources that everybody else helped me get in that initial period. So I'm very happy to be with you all. And then also my colleague isn't here today, but that's Marisol Behad and she is also a peer advisor for CCCP and a mother. Awesome. Thank you, Alicia. And we definitely do not want to have the day go by without introducing our amazing Parenting Webinar Communications League. So Daniel, take it away. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm a first generation non-traditional transfer student from East Los Angeles College. Um, and I'm the communications lead for the Parenting Webinar. And just like a lot of you, I'm very excited to be here and learn about all the different experiences that parenting students have. Thank you. Awesome. And we want, it, um, want you all to meet the rest of our CCP full-time staff team. So um, if I want to look at the, because I can't see the list of peeps, whoever sees their face first, they all can go first in introducing yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Santiago Bernal. I'm the assistant director for the center. I'm very excited to be here. I want to say, first of all, thank you to Perla and to Chelly for leading um, a group of parenting students into uh, creating today's webinar. Uh, it takes a village for certain, uh, and I'm just really happy to be surrounded by such brilliance. Um, uh, parents scholars bring just another dimension to the university. You are needed here, you are wanted here, and, and I'm excited just to be here today. Uh, myself, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. I came to the US in the 80s when the civil war was taking place. Um, I went to UCLA not as a transfer student. I came in as, as a freshman back in the 1900s. And um, now I'm um, I have been, well, uh, pretty much right after graduating from college, I started working with community college students. Um, that's almost 30 years ago. Uh, so for me, this is actually my child. <laughs> the, Working with uh, community college students, this, this, this is, and I'm so proud of what my child has become because he has become an inclusive, a, a caring, a, a, a uh, critical, uh, a loving uh, uh, being. And, and I think that's, that's what we're gonna try to um, share with you today. To be, uh, to be here with you uh, is really an honor. And again, I wanna thank the team who put it all together. Uh, I wanna say thank you to all the, uh, all the parents uh, all the all of you who have dependents, it's not easy, and uh, I do know that you are doing a tremendous uh, work. <laughs> Taking care of someone else is one of the biggest gifts you can give to anyone. So um, I'm I'm excited excited to be here. Thank you. I'll jump in next. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Greetings from wherever you may be joining us. It may not be morning where you are. Uh, my name is Jewel Bourne. I am one of the program coordinators here at the Center for Community College Partnerships. I have the pleasure and privilege of overseeing our partnership with Los Angeles Valley College. So hey, Alicia. <laughs> um, go Monarchs. Um, I am a transfer student myself. I was a participant in CCP. <clears throat> CCP prior to prior to uh, attending UCLA and transferring to UCLA. So I'm a very proud product of CCP and I never left home. Um, and so it is a privilege and an honor to share space with you all and to learn from you all. I'm not a parenting student myself, but I am the very proud aunt of two little ones who I am, you know, teaching, I'm a first generation college student. So I have the privilege of teaching them how to navigate and, and sharing with them my, tra my transfer journey, my college journey. Um, so um, I'm really excited to be with you all and learn from you all and share space. Um, and if I can be of any support in any way, um, please don't hesitate to ask um, or reach out. It's a pleasure to be with you all. So I'll go next. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Blanca Alcantara Hershey. I am the office coordinator as well as the communications co coordinator, along with Jewel. And um, I'm a transfer student. I, I was a transfer student from Santa Monica College, transferred to UCLA in 2011. Um, and I was able to graduate. But while at UCLA, I was one of the co chairs of IDEAS, uh, which is the support group for undocumented students. Um, and so I did a lot of advocacy work while I was in um, an undergrad. Um, I was not a parenting student during my undergrad uh, career, but I currently have a two-year-old who is my life, my rock. Um, so I, I'm just very um, excited to see all of you here. Um, and I hope you can, you can feel uh, part of the included in this community. So welcome. Um, I could go. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ariel. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm the program coordinator for CCP over at LA Southwest College at West LA College. Um, I transferred from Pasadena City College and I transferred to UCLA and I got my bachelor's in psychology. I'm also not a parenting student, but I'm really happy to be here with y'all. It's really nice to be in this space and community with all of you. Um, the team has planned a really wonderful webinar for y'all. Um, they put their heart into it. Um, so I really hope that you enjoy and just welcome to our space and we're happy to have you here. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, I have like, I'm logged into a different account. I didn't even realize. Um, but not, my name is Aurelia Reimer. I'm the STEM program coordinator for the Center for Community College Partnerships. Um, so just welcome everybody that's like said, a lot of the sentiment that was already shared, the parenting uh, committee has put together a really great webinar for you all, um, sharing resources on how you can be successful in your transfer journey. And even beyond that, um, we're here for you. Please ask questions. We're all here to help you be successful. So welcome and please listen and take notes and answer questions, ask questions. I can go next. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is uh, Frank Astorena Jr. And I am a program coordinator here at the Center for Community Culture Partnerships. And I oversee the partnerships between Los Angeles Trade Tech College and Los Angeles Mission College. I am also a proud transfer student, first gen student from East Los Angeles College. I transferred to UCLA, uh, graduated from UCLA and uh, went to grad school at USC. So I am a Brogen along with Perla. So to our Brogens and fellow Brogens, we are here, we are a community and I welcome everyone. Uh, thank you. Alrighty, I want to say that that's everyone. And Gabby's, Gabby's in here too. Oh, okay. I haven't seen her. Okay. Go ahead, Gabby. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, the parenting webinar. My name is Gabriela Abraham and I work for CCCP as a program representative. I'm a first generation non-traditional parenting student who transferred from Los Angeles Valley College to UCLA. I am also a first generation immigrant from Mexico and mother of two children. I was undocumented for more than 20 years and I also went back to school after 20 years. Uh, another thing about me, I graduated with a double major in Spanish community and culture and Chicano studies in 2017. I, my daughter and I, we both transferred from community college um, and we both gradu uh, graduated we transferred to UCLA and graduated, you know, in 2017. And we are a product of CCCP because um, we were part of the program two years before transferring. We were also, you know, as students at UCLA, we work as peer advisors. And now I'm currently working as, you know, as I mentioned before, program representative. Thank you all. And my son is part of the program too. He's attending Pierce College now. So the whole family, we are, you know, we are part of the CCCP family. Uh, again, well, uh, thank you for being here. You know, uh, ask questions, connect with presenters. And as all my colleagues, men colleagues mentioned, we, you know, we are here to provide resources and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Gabby. 
And I know we're missing some of our team. They couldn't be with us today, but we also have Alberto Moreno, who's here um, in a coordinator as well. We have Claudia Salcedo. Um, we have, and I think, yeah, everyone else is here. Um, so as we get started, we wanted to acknowledge the land um, of whose, whose land we stand on and occupy today. Um, the Center for Community College Partnerships at UCLA acknowledges the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tobangar, um, which is the LA Basin and so, um, the Channel Islands. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Terraxato in this place. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hunukvikam, um, Ahihirom, and Iyohikem, our relatives past, present, and emerging. So this is our CCCP Black Lives Matter statement. To our students and colleagues and the Black community and across the diaspora, we stand with you. You are valued and an important member of our campus and off-campus family. We all need to acknowledge the challenges and work to change them. We must work together as people of color and allies, people who are connected, who are concerned about our future to eliminate these systemic disparities. We take a stand today and always because Black Lives Matter. And then also CCCPs um, want to acknowledge the stop Asian hate and CCCP condemns hateful acts of violence, harassment, and rhetoric targeting Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and Desi Americans. Um, since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an alarming increase in the discrimination and violence perpetuated on the APID, A community. These acts of violence are nothing new. We are disturbed by these xenophobic, racially motivated attacks. CCCP stands in solidarity with all of our students, colleagues, and community partners who experience marginalization and threat. CCCP would also like to acknowledge the um, recent and we're also right still currently going through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the impact of the pandemic has been great. Uh, the death rate for Latino people is about 21% and for Black people is 9% higher than the um, statewide average. The case rate for communities with median income under 40, 40K thousand is 37% higher than the statewide average. And the community college students have the largest negative impact, particularly men of color who have experienced largest um, enrollment drops. Uh, we also suffer the most basic needs issues out of any other population. Um, UCLA returned to campus, so there is a plan. So for fall of 2021, close to 80% of courses would be offered in person as well as most labs. Um, UC will require anyone accessing UC facilities or in-person UC programs to be fully vaccinated prior to the fall term. Um, UCLA is also planning for on-campus housing this fall and expects to offer housing to first year transfers and to a higher percentage of second year transfers as well. Uh, Los Angeles mandates masks, in, which are into effect Saturday night, July, July 17. Thank you, Zuleika. Hey, everyone. Um, back again. Uh, talk a little bit about this little thing called critical race theory. It's just, you know, this uh, theory, right? And so everyone's scared of theory, uh, but theories around all of us, uh, we live our lives based on theory. Uh, we, the way that we look at the world is really a theory, right? It's, it's the way that we try to explain the world. And sometimes it's kind of scary, like, you know, to explain the world to people who may not understand uh, where we're coming from. So I know that critical race theory has been in the news um, lately uh, in, in, in uh, it's obviously simply another way of, 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 of attacking communities of color, of just um, invalidating our lives. So what is critical race theory? So um, hopefully maybe some of you have come across this uh, before, uh, but this is one of the things that we utilize at the center. Uh, 
And really what we're looking at is, is uh, a couple of things. So if you look at the, uh, at the chart, this chart is basically telling you um, the, the data of what happens to different groups as they move through the community college, right? So this is telling you, you know, that after four years, even though almost all students from all groups um, in terms of their aspirations and in terms of their, uh, what they, why they go to a community college is to transfer. Uh, when you look at the actual outcomes of who has uh, actually transferred within four years or, or completed some of the requirements to, uh, uh, to transfer in four, you know, within four years, you can see that there's a difference. There's a, 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 a huge disparity in the outcomes, right? So, uh, uh, and I, I really like how this article, by the way, this is from the college campaign, uh, the Campaign for College Education, a great organization based here in LA. And uh, what you can see from this is that, and the way that they, 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 they use the language is that um, a certain student was not supported to transfer within four years. And I like that because it's not saying, you know, these groups didn't transfer. What this is saying is the, 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 the educational system didn't support the students enough in order for them to transfer, right? Even though they had the aspiration, even though that was the goal that they, they came in with, that's not what, um, what happens. So when we look at race and ethnicity, uh, it isn't uh, to necessarily um, blame someone else for what, we, for what the challenges are. What it is, is we're trying to figure out and identify what, where, where, what can we do about it, right? So and in order to do something about it, we need to be able to get the data um, um, disaggregated in, in race and ethnicity, gender, all these other number of ways of, that we can look at data in order to ensure that every student um, that enters the community college with the dreams and aspirations of going to a university, that they're able to. It's not a question of you know who deserves the better or who has done the most. It's a, it's a, it's a question of uh, access and opportunity, right? And we do know that not everyone has the same type of access and opportunity. Not everyone experiences education in the same way. So what basically critical race theory is saying is trying to explain why these things happen, right? And what um, critical race theory is saying is that education as a result of the way in which it has been created in, within the US, in the, in, in the US context, it inherently is racist. And that race plays a role in all the institutions that are created within that system that is racist to begin with, right? Uh, systematically, um, th there's a group that has been advantaged and other groups have been disadvantaged because of this. Um, so what, what it also does, it challenges this um, dominant ideology. Instead of saying, you know, the reason why these groups are not doing well is because they lack this, they lack that, right? Uh, and, you know, depending on where, in, in where you may be at or depending on, you know, the time of historically speaking, uh, at some points it was, you know, it was a science to actually think that certain uh, races and ethnicities which were more um, were were better than others, right? So, um, and, and now is the certain groups are not interested in education. Certain groups uh, don't have this or that, right? So that's 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 the challenge that critical race theory is saying. It's saying no, let's not look at what you as a students may be lacking. Let's not look at what, you know, how we need to fix you as a parent and student. That's not, that's not the problem. The problems are the systems that have been set up so that they don't provide the type of support that you need as a parent and student, right? So uh, it's challenging that idea that, uh, you know, that, that as a parent and student, you lack something or you're a challenge. You're not the challenge. The, cha the challenge is the systems in which you have to navigate to get to places like UCLA. Uh, and then we value experiential knowledge, right? What that means is that, of course, you know, uh, we're in a research institution, so we understand the importance of observation, right? So being, uh, being able to observe phenomena, what happens and what, what have you, right? That's important. But also the knowledge that we bring is also just as important. And that's what this, this is saying. It's saying that your lived experiences, are important 
to be to be able to tell us what are the things that we need to do. So this is centralizing your lives, centralizing um and and, and, and saying that what you um, have lived can be used as 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 research, as data, as information to guide us in where the solutions should be at, right? Um, what better people to tell us what um what needs to happen than those who are actually experiencing uh, education in this kind of way, right? Um, and, and, and the other part of this is, of course, uh, that we need to also not only value the knowledge, but the experience as well, right? So uh, that's really important. And then uh, yeah, click, click on it. The next, the next part, which is really, I, I think is really important here, right? This is number four, um, which would be um, the intersectionality and the um, uh, interdisciplinary approach that we take. So because of that, I wanted to also show this uh, other um, data that I just found yesterday, uh, which, um, which uh, basically shows, um, and it just came out this year. Actually, I didn't even know that it was out. So um, I was glad that, you know, yesterday I was like looking through some other stuff and I found it. And, I, and by the way, I put this information also in the um, in the in the in the page um, in the web page as well. So, um, but this is basically saying that your all your different identities, right? All those different identities, uh, they are negotiating with each other as you move to the, and navigate um, these educational spaces. So, for example, uh, as you can see from here. Uh, most of the students who are entering as parenting students into higher ed, right? Most of the students are at a community college. Almost 72% of the students uh, who are parenting students in all of the educational institutions in California, right, are at a community college. That's number one. And then number two, 80% of those students who are at a community college as parenting students are female, right? So that's, uh, that's also important. And then, and then if we look at race and ethnicity, then we can see that the majority of the students, 75% of the students who are parents and students, who are female, right, are also students of color, right? So whatever type of services are gonna be provided and, and whatever type of experiences that you have had are gonna be really important to understand because they will tell us what we need to do. So we know, for example, in this, in this, uh, in the same, um, um, document says that many of the students who uh, they interview have experienced negative uh, aspects at the community college in terms of the services, in terms of being told, you know, you cannot bring your children here to get the services that you, you, you know, that you need to get. Uh, even though that by definition, if you're a parenting student, that's exactly what you would bring. You would bring your children. I mean, that's, that's, that's it, it, you know, again, not designing the programs with the people that you're providing the service with is, is, is what, um, again, is the systematic aspect of what will uh, make someone want to not be part of the program, right? Uh, and then the last, um, the last part of this is the commitment to social justice, right? Uh, and I, I, in, in this one, I want to just, I want to highlight someone uh, who's here, Suleika, who is committed to social justice. Uh, and and um, uh, she mentioned that, you know, students are getting housing this year, right? Uh, transfer students and her and a number of other um, uh, transfer students at UCLA took the leadership to ensure and to keep this university accountable. That they, because at first they were not gonna offer any housing to second, transfer, uh, second year transfer students. And Suleika, and again, a number of other uh, um, uh, community college transfer students, parent students, all kinds of students, they, they said that's not that's not right. And now we do have, and we uh, are going to offer, it's not like, you know, 100%, but we do have something and it is because of that social commitment. We cannot just have theories just, you know, so they, like, they can look pretty here in the university. They need to do something. And uh, what critical race theory is saying is that we don't want just to be theorizing and, you know, uh, philosophizing we need we need action as well. So this is what, in, you know, of course I'm doing a disservice to critical race theory because people spend you know years uh, uh, careers um, doing this type of work. But I, I highly encourage you to uh, 
look into it. We're not telling you you need to believe in it. Uh, we're telling you be critical. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to have this space. And thank you again for being here with us. Thank you, Santi. Always enjoy um, when you speak on, on critical race theory. Thank you so much. So one of the other components and theories that we utilize at CCP is community cultural wealth. Um, so this is also an article that we posted on our website for you to read further and get more information, but really acknowledge all the wealth and the capital, um, all the assets that you already possess, right? As students of color, as community college students, as parenting students, um, you bring with you um, a number of different capitals such as linguistic, aspirational, familial, social, navigational, resistant, and cultural capital. Um, and as we continue and as you continue being part of CCP and our scholars program, this is definitely something that we talk about um, a lot, right? Particularly as it retains to the UC application and the PIQs and really doing that work of acknowledging um, all the capital that you currently already possess and that you bring with you to the institution, um, whichever institution it is that you choose to transfer to. Alrighty, so we did wanna cover some community guidelines um, with you all, which y'all are all doing perfectly. So some netiquette, so respect the cyber community, Please keep your microphone muted and click on speak, uh, speaker view. That way you can, you know, see whoever's speaking. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to utilize the chat feature. And already I see so many of you with amazing questions and I see our team already answering those questions. Keep on doing that. That's what we want uh, you all to do. So keep asking questions. We'll keep on answering them. Uh, questions will be answered during the Q&A portion after each panel. Um, so yes, you do have an opportunity to um, ask questions. So make sure you use the chat when there's a panel because then we'll be able to read those questions and then ask them for you. Step in, step back. So if you've been speaking a lot um, and you see that others haven't, you know, step back and encourage others to speak. One diva, one mic. That means right now I'm the diva, right? And then no one's interrupting me. So that's what we want to be able to continue to do. Challenge ideas, not the messenger. Do not be afraid to ask. And that's a big one because this is why we're having it. Um, well, this is why we're having this webinar. We're having this webinar for you, for the parenting students that are coming in. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. You have so many people here today that their only intention is to inform you and to give you all the tools that you need. So please, please don't be afraid to ask questions. This is going to be our agenda uh, for the day. Um, so Please be mindful that we are here from 10 to 12, 15, maybe a little bit past because we are running a little behind. Um, and then you will have a 30 minute break for session one, for session two, 1245 p.m. to 330. And again, we have a, a jam pack uh, agenda, but it's all for the sake of you um, and for to give you the knowledge that I know you are wondering about regarding transfer. And with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and give it over to Zuleika, who will be introducing our keynote for, for the morning. Hi, everyone again. So I am so honored to introduce our next guest, Joanna Reyes Walton. Joanna is such a game changer for parenting student advocacy. She has paved the way for many parenting students and a lot of the resources that we get on campus. And I personally see Joanna as a mentor I'm just really happy and honored to introduce uh, <laughs> Joanna Reyes. So Joanna is a PhD candidate in UCLA's Department of Art History who works on Viceregal, Mexican and Chicanx art. Her research explores the ties between silver mining and civic identity in 18th century Zacatecas. From 2016 to 2019, she served as the book review editor for Aslan, a journal of Chicano studies and is an organizing member of Mothers of Color and Academia de UCLA. Joanna has helped found multiple UCLA campus entities, including the Bruin Lactation Coalition and the Students with Dependents Task Force. 
and was appointed as a charter member of the UCOPs, which is the UC um, Office of the President's first ever task force to address parenting student needs. Joanna has previously worked as a research assistant and curatorial um, assistant in the Latin American Art Department at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and as a research associate at the Hispanic Society Museum and Library. Very, <laughs> has a huge background. So I want to introduce Joanna reyes Walton. Hey guys, thank you so much Zulika for the really kind introduction. Um, likewise, I just have to say quickly that Zulika is incredible and the work that she's been doing for the past few years at UCLA is really inspirational and um, it's amazing to see the torch being passed. So thank you for all of your hard work and thank you for inviting me to be the speaker today for this program. Um, also I wanna give a shout out to Santiago for his um, introduction to critical race theory. I know that right now it's really kind of a buzzword and a topic that's going around in the news a lot. When he's talking about intersectionality, um, my talk today is going to hit on that um, in a really personal way. So when you hear about intersectional intersectionality, it's like you know this idea that your you know struggles are so intertwined that it's hard to kind of um, unravel them and, and say, well, it's because of this or that, right? You have issues of um, you know gender, sexuality, parenting status, um, class, et cetera, that come into play in your life, right? When you're doing things, um, and I'm going to hit on a little bit of all that today. Um, my talk is going to be pretty personal. Um, there are a lot more people here than I anticipated, which is awesome because I think that really speaks to sort of the robustness of the parenting student community who are, um, you know, seeking to attain higher education. That's incredible. On a Saturday, y'all, that's great. Um, and so, yeah, just be advised that my, my presentation will be a little bit personal because my academic journey has been very personal. Um, so I'm going to get into it with y'all. So I'm going to share a um, a little slide presentation. It feels weird. I feel like I'm showing you guys um, like a personal photo album, um, but I'm an art historian, so I like pictures. So there you have it. You're going to be looking at pictures with me. Um, so let me see here. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's hard to do this in the Zoom window, so I'm just trying to make sure that it goes. There we go. All right. So um, so this is going to be my academic journey. This is a picture of me and my two kiddos, uh, Liliana and Julian. Nope. Um, so Lily is now 12 and Julian is now six. Um, the objectives for the talk that I'm going to give to you guys is just to normalize non-traditional stories in academia. Um, that phrase always kind of strikes me a little odd um, because I think that there is no one picture of what a student looks like now. You know, I think that thankfully things are getting really diverse and um, we're recognizing more and more that, you know, there's, there's not really a traditional student. We all have these um, unique stories and backgrounds. Um, I also wanna share some struggles and successes from a graduate uh, parenting student perspective. Um, so the kind of general topics that I'll cover will be kind of where I am in my program and who I am, um, how I got here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about parenting a uh, student from the trenches and some tips and takeaways that I've learned. Okay, so for the official stuff, um, where I am, I am about to file my dissertation, actually. My PhD is expected September 2021. Uh, September 10th is the big date that I file. Um, I'm in the Department of Art History. And yeah, so I'll be filing at the end of the summer. Um, when I came into UCLA, I started in 2015. Um, I received a Cotorola scholarship, which is this um, diversity fellowship basically that um, gives you funding for four years and it's $25,000 a year is what you receive as a stipend. Um, I like to be open about that because um, I'm a single mom of two kids and living in Los Angeles. That's not a lot, uh, if, you, if you guys know. That's a, and this is considered to be a bump up for my department from what they typically pay graduate students. So um, still, you know, I received this prestigious fellowship, grateful to have it. Um, but the reality is that that's not a lot of income, right? Um, currently, I have two articles in peer-reviewed journals out. I um, have a book review, um, a catalog entry for LACMA, and several web publications. So those are kind of my academic bona fides. Um, now, who I am. So um, I'm actually a first-generation college student, um, and my parents both come from large, poor families in rural agricultural communities in Texas. Um, so my mom's one of 12, and my dad is one of nine. My dad grew up picking cotton with his family. Uh, my mom remembers climbing on roofs and helping her dad before she was able to ride a bike. Um, so yeah, my trajectory being here at UCLA doing this is all pretty pretty far out. Um, my family originally has from Zacatecas. So this is me with my aunts on the uh, rancho a year or two ago. Um, I was smart about the way I planned my, my research. So I get to travel and see my family when I go, which is really special. 
Um, so both of my parents actually did try to go to college, um, which was a lot considering that they were from these really big, um, you know, poor families. But my dad quit after one semester to just start working because that was kind of what he needed to do. And my mom ended up doing um, an associate's degree at a community college um, rather than attain a four-year degree. So I'm still the first in my family to attain a four-year degree, let alone the advanced degrees that I've gone on to, to earn. Um, and when my mom was in community college, I was like a kid, I was like five, and she would take me and my sister sometimes because she couldn't have a babysitter, like she couldn't afford a babysitter a lot of times. And um, that really, that stayed with me and I was able to imagine myself being in college. And so when I graduated from high school, I actually went to the same community college that my mom had attended and even had one of the same professors, um, her name is Deanne Marchand, I think. Um, so it felt really special, you know, I felt, um, for me, that was a step that I was able to take, right? Like I could envision myself there. And that's kind of the way that my academic journey has been, right? It's just taking that next that next step. So I started in my, my small hometown, 150,000 people. Um, and then I decided to move to the Dallas area and went to another community college there because I really wanted to go to university in Dallas, um, but didn't really feel quite ready to take that big step. Um, so I was working jobs. I worked at a call center, um, eventually was able to go ahead and start my four-year degree at a state school. And I worked the whole time and split tuition payments with my parents. I was really fortunate to not have to take out student loans um, because yeah, I was able to just work work and split payments with my parents and was able to get out of college without any debt, which was really nice. Um, it was kind of interesting. So, you know, when my first job that I had was when I was 16 years old and I worked with my dad, like at an electronic store, it's called Circuit City. I don't think they exist anymore. Um, and, you know, I think that having that background, like being from a working class family, has been really important, right? Like I, I learned the value of, of hard labor and, you know, that there's no such thing as a, as, you know, a bad job. Like you just do honest work and, um, and it's always valuable, right? So I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute about how those like different experiences have really helped me to, to be where I am now. Um, when I was doing my master's degree, so I did my, I did my bachelor's and, um, of course, like wasn't able like a bachelor's in art history. It's not, there's not a lot of options to do like to do with that degree. Um, so I realized I needed to get a master's degree if I wanted to move on. So during my master's is when my daughter Liliana was born. And this is me graduating on the left and there's baby Lily. Um, and that was a challenge, right? Like at, at the time I just extended my degree by a little bit so I could kind of be with her. Um, and she would come to the library with me. I'd strap her on, you know, a little baby carrier and she would come to the library, come to the museum. Um, you know, kind of wherever I needed to be, she just went along with me because that was what I had to do. Um, so I made it through that. Um, and art history has really taken me into some interesting directions, um, some things that I sort of never thought that I would be doing. Um, so for instance, while I was working on my master's degree, um, I volunteered with the Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas. If you know a little bit about modern art, it's that uh, like Prada storefront that's out in the middle of nowhere in a desert, that's part of it. Um, I also did an archaeological field school in, uh, in Italy, and I worked as a grad student lecturer at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Um, while I was finishing my thesis, I took on a position working for a Dallas collector of samurai armor. Um, so that's me in the middle installing samurai armor. Lily was about two, I think, and um, I just took a short trip to Paris to install this exhibition. And um, yeah, I ended up going to the Hispanic Society and working there. Um, while I was at the Hispanic Society, I actually identified um, an unknown person that was in a painting at the Prado Museum in Spain and um, co-authored an article with the senior paintings curator there named Marcus Burke. Um, and more recently, I worked at LACMA as a research assistant to the head of the Latin American Art Department. So on the right is a picture of like the opening of one of the shows. Um, and all this is to say, right, like you, you kind of get pulled in these different directions and I've sort of followed the career trajectory you know, what is the next opportunity that I can do? You know, what makes sense? Um, I, you know, took the little step from community college to my state school. From there, you know, was able to get into a terminal master's program um, because I wasn't sure, you know, I was like, is, can I really do, at the time, I didn't think I could do a PhD. I was like, I don't know if this is for me. Um, no one in my family has a PhD. I don't know what that looks like, um, but I think I can take this next step. I think I can try a master's degree and see where that gets me, right? So, um, I realized that my career options with the terminal masters were actually limited. When I got my job at LACMA in 2013, um, I realized that was the best job I was ever going to have with a master's degree. It's a great job. It was a great job. But I was also, you know, in my early 30s and I thought this can't be it. Like I want to I want to be able to do more and go further right with my career. So um, 
I thought, okay, we're going to go ahead and, and try this PhD thing out. So um, I got fun, you know, got into UCLA, a fully funded program, um, and it felt like a dream. You know, I thought, gosh, this is really incredible. I've been able to to get into this R1 university, this fantastic university, and it's funded. Um, but pursuing that dream, you know, put me in a city that was thousands of miles away from my family. I didn't have a great support system. Um, and I had two young kiddos. And so these are my kids when I got accepted to UCLA on the left, that's what they look like. Um, so yeah, and just navigating the rough waters of academia. Um, between the time that I applied to UCLA and then I got into UCLA, right? So it's almost like a year or like nine months or whatever between when you submit the application and when you start. Um, so during that time, I had a bunch of change in my life. Um, after my kiddo and my son was born, um, my marriage kind of fell apart, like my husband and I separated. So, you know, I was here starting a PhD program, you know, as a single mom going from, you know, two incomes to like no income because I wasn't working full time at the museum anymore. Um, and I found myself really uh, not well supported. Um, so I came to the university and realized that, you know, that there were things, things were not really set up well. Um, for parenting students back in 2015. I think that there has been a lot of um, progress on that front. And I do think that um, that the organizing work that we've done has been part of that. Um, but for instance, there wasn't even lactation space for me to go pump for my son. So, you know, he was like a few months old when I started and um, it, was, it was really tough. I mean, I was very fortunate that my advisor um, gave me a key to her office and she would let me pump in there. But um, I started realizing, you know, gosh, the built environment of this university is really not set up well for lactating women, let alone parenting students, right? Um, I, the first quarter that I was at UCLA, um, I ran out of money to pay for childcare. And I told my advisor, like, I can't afford classes anymore. I can either pay my rent or I can pay a babysitter. I can't do both. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, hustling and, and you know, kind of scurrying around. And um, I was able, I got a position at the early child care and education program at UCLA, but the cost was equal to my stipend um, my, because my son was an infant, right? So it was a little over $2,000, I think, or about $2,000 a month. And again, I'm making $25,000 a year as a graduate student. Um, so I was like, I can't do that. Like, I, that's just not possible for me, right? So um, again, there was a little bit more hustling and I was able to get a subsidized child care spot um, which was, you know, pay by scale. So um, the title, title five does support um, low income student parents um, and it pays for, for childcare rights. So um, I was able to get a title five spot at UCLA's child care education program. My son went from the time that he was, you know, a baby until he was old enough to go to elementary school. And um, that was, it was great. You know, it was great having that support, but there are a few spots available, right? So I think there are 43 subsidized childcare spots out of like 350 spots total, um, right? So uh, there, it, it's it's expensive and uh, not accessible to a lot of people. Um, in any case, uh, aside from just the issue of lactation and having access to childcare, um, you know, there there were other things going on on campus that I thought you know that, that could be better for parenting students, right? So as a response to this inequity um, that I was facing as a single mom on campus. Um, I became an organizing member of Mothers of Color in Academia at UCLA. So it's a group of mamas, like three other mamas that had, you know, started kind of talking about parenting issues and, you know, like, hey, I feel like this could be different or a little better. Um, so this is a student collective of, collective of women of color, mother scholars. Um, founding mamas are indigenous, Central American, Chicana, Mexicana, right? Um, and we started organizing to build a, a systemic support and help to help enforce policies that would address the unique needs of mothers of color and allies. Um, so the image on the right is a picture of an action that we did, I think in 2016, um, where we we had like a Dia de Muertos um, act, like action where we um, mourned mothers and parents who had been pushed out of the academy. Um, you know, by, by inadequate policies and inadequate support, right? So we had a whole thing. We marched to the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And um, from there, we, you know, started meeting with people, right? We got it, we got on some people's radar. Um, so as part of that group, you know, over the years, we have made so many um, like connections across campus and met with a lot of stakeholders. 
Um, so I've met with the Vice Chancellor of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. I've spoken before the Board of Directors during the contract negotiations with the uh, union. And I've worked closely with campus partners, including the Reproductive Health Interest Group and the Students with Dependents Office. Um, I also helped to found the, the UCL entities that um, Zuleika mentioned, so the Students with Dependents Work Group. Um, and that includes people from, from all over campus, right? So there are people from um, community programming, from the registrar's office, from early child care and education, um, because as parenting students, our, our needs are so faceted, right? Like we, there are so many different areas of our life um, that are affected by, you know, by being parents and by caring for other people. It's not just, um, you know, I, I just need a little bit of extra money to pay for, you know, to pay for the extra expenses of having kids, right? It's not just financial, it's, you know, it's adequate um, access to insurance that's affordable for our families. It's, you know, basic needs being covered. It's being able to register for classes at hours that work for you because you have to take your kid to childcare or, or take your kid to school or whatever. Um, so we, we gathered people from all over campus, you know, from healthcare, from everywhere to, to come together, to get in a room and say, how can we better support parenting students? Um, and I'm really proud of that work. We also, um, you know, made the group of the Bruin Lactation Coalition, and those stakeholders include members of the School of Public Health, the Ronald Reagan Medical Center, and Student Affairs. Um, yeah, so also helping to found that first ever parenting student task force at UC's Office of the President. Um, which is currently under the leadership of Liz Halima. And we just had a white paper and I helped to present it to the vice chancellors of student affairs uh, like last month. Um, so that was really exciting. So for the first time we were able to gather a lot of data about parenting students. Um, something that we found out a couple of years into this work is just that data regarding parenting students was just not being collected. So there wasn't an accurate count of how many parenting students, especially grad students, were on campus at UCLA or at any of the UCs, um, and nor is there any kind of centralized office for, um, for parenting students in most cases across the UCs. So um, being part of that process of just like, who are the parenting students? What are the needs? Um, let's start asking these questions. That was really important. Um, so yeah, I mean, so my, my trajectory at UCLA has really been, you know, kind of helping to figure out how we can help parenting students not struggle the same way that we have. Um, and that's, that's, you know, I don't want any other mothers, especially single moms to be in the position that I was in where I sat in my advisor's office. Like I was this close to sort of having my dream of being in this PhD program at this fantastic university and just saying, I can't afford it. Like I can't do it. Um, and I don't want another mother to have to be in that position. Um, so there's another image of us at an action on the left. I think this may have been when the regents were there. And on the right is a picture of um, me with Senator Glazer. So I had the opportunity to um, to work with Senator Glazer on a bill regarding making CalWORKs more accessible for parenting students. Um, so I actually spoke at a the Senate committee hearing or something for that, um, which was really an interesting experience. If you haven't been to the Capitol, um, it, it's pretty wild. So in any case, um, my work um, advocating as a parenting student has been one way that I've really found meaning in my struggle. Um, yeah, because it's it's hard, right? Like I think that if I had been only focused on sort of my grind and like only on the academic side of what I do, I think I wouldn't have been able to sort of accept um, the hard things that were also happening at the same time, right? I had to sort of picture a future in which someone else wouldn't have that same problem. And it's like, how do you get there if no one else is doing the work or if it's not being done? Um, you know, like I want it now, like I, I don't want, I want parents coming in behind me to have childcare. I want the people that are entering next year to have um, enough money to pay for insurance for their kids, right? Um, so having that as a sort of side gig as I've been also working towards my degree has been really important and in, um, in feeling like I'm doing something that has a meaning. Um, and finally, I think I'm, I feel like I'm, I know we're running a little bit late, so I'm gonna try to um, wrap it up. Um, but just some takeaways that I wanted you guys to have about um, being a parenting student. So I know that you guys are not coming into a graduate program now, right? Like we're going in for a four-year degree. Um, but I still think that a lot of the takeaways that I've learned and that I've sort of, um, yeah, just kind of come, come to figure out as I've been doing this thing um, are applicable, right? So um, the first one is to just access the resources that you have. Um, I think that this is getting better, that colleges are kind of recognizing more like how to reach out to parenting students and to, to make things available. Um, so whatever resources you have, you need, start looking for them. Um, you know, if you have school aged kids, you know, are there any programs to connect your kids with schools closer to university? Um, you know, access to childcare, 
for the first time, uh, being a student, a PhD student and a single mom, this is the first time I've ever had to rely on any public services. And that was a tough pill for me to swallow. Um, so, you know, but I did it because that's what my family needed, right? So the insurance is too expensive for my kids at UCLA. Um, so my kids have been on Medi-Cal. Um, I've had to be on CalFresh at different times because it's just, I just can't, I don't have enough money, right? So um, accessing the resources that you need to be successful is super important. I knew that it was better for me to, you know, access public services than to take on multiple part-time jobs that would take away from my real job of being a student. Um, so access the resources that you need to be successful. Try to line that out, you know, as early as you can. Um, another part of it is community. Community is so important. Um, I think my village is very different than I imagined it would be, uh, you know, because I come from a you know big family, but everyone's in Texas, like everyone's kind of far away. So I've built this new community of wonderful people, um, the organizing mamas that have become some of my best friends and advocates to, you know, I have a whole single mama squad. We're on the right hand side. And, um, you know, it's undergraduate moms, you know, MA student moms, other PhD moms. We met, you know, through family housing or through daycare. And, you know, sometimes it's something so simple as like, who can walk my kids to school when I'm running late? Oh, I can phone out my neighbor or phone out my friend. Um, so having those, those people that you can turn to in moments when you're um, just needing a little help is so important. Um, but also, you know, community of scholars. You're not just a parent, right? You're also a student and you're becoming an, an academic and a scholar. So um, it's important to, to find people that you can connect with on different levels. Um, in my case, I, I really turned to the uh, Chicano Studies Department. Um, I found a lot of people over there with kind of similar backgrounds and similar family stories. And um, that's been really key for me too, right? Just having people that I feel like get me and that also are kind of pursuing like a parallel academic journey. So, you know, there's this kind of unwritten curriculum when you're in college, especially if you're a first gen student, like you don't know how certain things work or like what are office hours and how do you do A, B, or C. And so finding, um, you know, colleagues, right? So academic colleagues are people who you can turn to to help um, sort some of that stuff out is, is super important. And um, I think the last thing that I wanna say as a takeaway is just um, find the strength in your story. Um, I think a lot of times we hear about the struggle of being a parenting student and how it, it kind of, you know, throws some wrenches into your plans or it makes things different. Um, I know for me that um, at the end of the day, I know that being a parent is the most important thing that I'm gonna do. So that helps to kind of ratchet down some of the anxiety about, oh, am I getting enough publications or, oh, I didn't get this prestigious fellowship or whatever, you know, because my academic career will take care of itself. Like I will work on it. But um, at the end of the day, I know that you know, my kids need me and, you know, it's always gonna be to me the most important thing that I'm doing. Um, but also just kind of the strengths of your of your background and like, um, you know, your work history. For instance, I worked doing research, like clinical research for a few years. Um, and that's so unrelated, right, from my academic stuff. But at the same time, um, you know, I was able to kind of spin that when I was doing my applications and saying like, look, like I used to have to read these really long research protocols. And um, that's helped me to, to become a good researcher in general. So when I'm doing academic work, um, it informs the way that I like approach whatever, A, B, or C, right? So um, I think that if you if you consider your past, right, and start looking for the strengths and how the skills that you already have, you know, coming out of a community college, you've learned the kind of the basics for, you know, how does college work? What's a syllabus? All that stuff, right? You know how to study, you know how to, how to do things. Um, so you, you have some advantages and being aware of what those are and like the field that you're on when you're going into college is so important. Um, so yeah, just find the strengths of your story and, um, and find your people and I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm trying, I think I might've gone over, but um, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you all today. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I'm so grateful to have you here. Um, I, I've heard of you, but I'm just happy that I now have heard you in person. So I'm just so happy that you were here with us um, talking to you know future parenting transferring students. Your story is extremely impactful. Um, and I hope everyone um, took a little bit of what she had to say today. Um, and thank you one, once again for being here with us today. All right, well, with that being said, we are gonna be transitioning to our student success panel, which I'm so excited because we have some amazing people here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do some spotlight on them real quick. And I am gonna be having Alicia moder moderating um, this session of the event. So give me one second. 
Hi, everybody. For those who may have joined in late and didn't hear my introduction earlier, my name is Alicia Inez Lopez, and I'm a Los Angeles Valley College transfer at UCLA and student parent. And again, this is a really full circle moment because I will be moderating a panel of people who are pivotal to my trajectory and me being here at UCLA, um, specifically Miss Rebecca Redmond and Brenda Coronel. So I am so happy to be here and I'm gonna have all four of the panelists introduce themselves before we get started. So let's start off with Rebecca. Hello, so cute. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Perla. Oh, oh, no, I know so many people in this space that I'm way too geek. I need to relax because I'm so excited to see all these people I haven't seen my dogs for so long. Okay, um, so I'm Rebecca Redman. I am a CCCP scholar forever and always. Um, the first parenting site, 2017. Um, I see Dean here was a mentor. Um, Carla was one of the mentors at the time. Um, Brenda was one of the first people in the cohort. Um, and I am currently going into my second year of grad school at UCLA in the School of Social Welfare. I, um, I have three children. I mean, I can go on and on. I don't know what I'm even supposed to be saying. Okay, so undergrad sociology and African-American studies from UCLA. I transferred from West LA College and um, I went to like a million other community colleges. So I think that that's, uh, I think that's it. So I could pass it on to Brenda. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm also a current UCLA MSW student at Luskin with Rebecca. We've been, we've known each other since 2017, as she mentioned, as well as Dean. And it's crazy, four years later, we're all still connected. That's what the parenting site does. It brings you a social capital, gives you the resources, and equips you to transfer into UCLA. I'm also a double Bruin. I also majored in sociology with Rebecca too. So she's been by my side this whole time. And me and her will both be done in a year. And yeah, I'll pass it on to Dean. Hello, everyone. My name is Dean Steckman. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm a single parent of two. I have a 15-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son. And Brenda was actually my mentee. So um, she, like they mentioned, they were both part of the first cohort and I was a mentor at the time. So I was actually um, leaving. So I was graduating at the time and moving on to get my master's at Cal State Long Beach. Um, so it was great to be able to be a part of the first ever cohort for the parenting site. Um, and what else was mentioned? Oh yeah, so I went to Marina Valley College and I got two associate's degrees, one in master's, uh, one in math and science and the other one was in social and behavioral studies. I actually transferred to UCLA as a psychology major, and I could talk about that later if it comes up, but I really didn't care for it at, um, at UCLA, and I shared that with my mentees too, so I ended up double majoring in gender studies and psychology, and psychology was bringing down my GPA, to be real, you know, being a single parent was really hard, um, and low income, like was mentioned, and all this other stuff that might come up during our um, questions. Uh, but I ended up dropping psychology as a major because I knew I wanted to pursue my master's degree specifically at the institution that I went to and it was very competitive. So it was a great decision because I ended up getting into it and I just focused on gender studies, which was more aligned with what I wanted to do because it's like intersectionality, social justice driven and all this other stuff. So definitely aligned with um, what I, who I am and how I identify. Um, and then I transferred, or after I graduated in, um, I transferred to UCLA in 2015, graduated in 2017, and then went straight into my master's like a couple months later. And then I just graduated actually during the pandemic with my master's um, during 2020, because my master's program was three years long. Thank you. Um, and so I just graduated during the pandemic. So we really didn't have like a celebration, which really sucked, but I still got the degree and I was able to land my dream job. Uh, to straight off of, you know, straight out of gra grad school, like a couple months later. So that's what I'm working in now. I'm actually work at, um, sorry, College of the Desert as a CalWORKs uh, counselor coordinator. And I was once a CalWORKs scholar too. So um, I came for a full circle pretty much. So I'll talk about that later though. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Perfect. Thank you so much to all of you and congratulations on all of your accomplishments because you have all accomplished so much and still 
inspirational to this day. So thank you so much. And we're going to go ahead and jump into the questions. So whoever wants to go ahead and answer, feel free to answer. If all of you want to answer, great. If none of you want to answer, just let me know. Um, so firstly, tell us about your experience as a parenting student at your community college. We want to give our students a kind of a feeling to see if they can relate to you guys right now that they are at the CCC. So whoever wants to go in first. Um, you said our experience as a parenting student at, at CC, right? Yeah, at the community college. So um, for me, it was really, and I find this to be really similar with a lot of other parenting students, that it was really just about like, let me just go to my class and go home. Like, I didn't have a lot of involvement on campus. I didn't know any other parenting students really. Um, and there wasn't a lot of there was really no social capital there. There was no networking. It was really just about me transferring. I was just focused on, okay, how do I transfer? How do I get out of here? Um, and it was kind of taboo to be a parenting student at community college. It was kind of like hush hush. Like there was no, you definitely weren't celebrated. If anything, there was a negative connotation with like you doing things backwards or you making bad decisions. Like, why are you here? Especially with me being an older student and literally some of the students age, <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing here? Like, so I think that's really important to talk about because there's a lot of shame around like the narrative of being a student parent, especially when you're a young parent, like a teen parent. So it's like, no matter when I went to college, I would have been a parent. Like I was a teen mom. So I think with that, there's, there's a lot of societal shame around that. And I mean, academia in generally, I think in general still shames parenting students and doesn't provide a lot of outlets for us. But particularly in my my community college more so, it's not something that was like shocking when people found out that I had kids. Um, They're like, what? Oh my God, what are you doing here? Kind of like you were an alien. It was really weird, actually. Um, and I don't know if it was just me or like the confidence as I transitioned and having like this network of friends who like, like I don't even consider like Brenda my friend. Like Brenda's like my family, literally, like she said. And same thing with like Alicia, like these are like my people, like. I don't even say like, not even my friend, like these are my people that know like my whole, more than they want to know about my life, believe me. <laughs> Every detail, Zuleika too, that's why she's laughing. Nancy too, that's why she's laughing. Like these are like my for real people. Like, oh my God, my kid is doing this or I'm doing this. Like we're doing 10 million things. And I think that's because we're parents and I'm, I'm going off on a tangent per usual. So let me stay focused. I digress, but yeah, it's really, I think there's a lot of shame around it. And then when you transition and, and you start this network of people, that have this this commonality of being a parent, it becomes so important. You feel like royalty as a parent. Yeah, I am a parent and this is not, you know, because of, not in spite of, but because of this, I am where I am. Like this has motivated me to be in that position. I think you're more celebrated when you carry that as like the shame of being a parent I think a lot of folks look at you like wow this is so inspiring like I'm I'm struggling my internet's bad sorry y'all um but like I'm struggling and barely hanging on and you trying to you know you're over here killing it with all these kids and all these other responsibilities so it's really empowering um but not really in my community college is the moral of the story <laughs> I'm gonna let somebody else talk um so I started off community college like Rebecca to focus on working multiple part-time jobs just to afford a family sustaining job as a single parent. Um, I worked retail, so I was always a full-time student um, because my main goal was to pursue my master's degree. I knew in order to be the psychotherapist that I wanted to be, I had to have at least a master's degree. So that take that took me at least six years, my daughter's six years. So this whole time that I've been in school, she's, she's just, um, you know, the whole time she's been alive, I've been in school. So there's a lot of guilt that we carry as parenting students. So that's, I feel like that's why we're so focused on school that we sometimes don't make time to socialize. And that's how I was in community college. I was too focused on work and I did, just didn't have time, but it wasn't until I started working on campus that I started involving myself in groups. I became board members for underrepresented students, uh, for undocumented students and for parenting students. 
And that's when I really began to like um, build like a social capital. And I was introduced to resources like the parenting site back in 2017. It was the very first cohort. And right there, I made long life friends, as Rebecca mentioned, we're all family. And not only did it equip me to transfer, but it gave me the resources um, to make me competitive to get into UCLA. I'm a double Bruin. And it also, um, it's just a great, like a great program. And yeah, <laughs> I'll let Dean talk. Uh, yeah, so basically echo what was said already. Um, there's definitely that, uh, there was when I was attending, I think that we have more resources out there now, more like we're more visible, but there was like a negative stigma um, surrounding parenting students. Um, just like where, where, what Rebecca said that, oh, you should have done this already before you had kids and all of this other judgmental type stuff. But as I mentioned before, I was also a CalWORK student. So there's also a negative uh, stigma attached to that because you're on welfare. And so I had so many, like, I have so many stories to tell about that um, with, you know, my county workers judging me and saying, well, why don't you just work? And why do we have to pay for your books? And why do we have to give you these resources so you can go to college back in my day? You know, I'm, I work several jobs to pay for books and all this stuff and you're just getting it for free. Not knowing that like I was working too. It wasn't like I was just, you know, and plus I'm going to school, I'm pursuing higher education so that I could actually get a well-paying job so I can support me and my kids and not have to be on county. Like it's not easy being on county. They, they make you jump through hoops to get stuff. And so it was very hard. And then even just walking into that space because you're like labeled, you know, students are seeing you or it's fa faculty staff and you're just thinking that you're being judged like, oh, they get, you know, welfare benefits or whatever. Um, but yeah, so it was it was definitely hard. Um, and me going to community college, actually, I didn't know that it was possible at first. So I started going to community college when I was 26 years old um, and still like I had my kids at the time. So I was a single parent with two kids. And I was living with my parents because I was working at Subway up the street and um, up the street from Moreno Valley College. And my, my parents lived in Moreno Valley too. So, but I was working like six days a week, but minimum wage and like $7 an hour and working pretty much the whole day. So I didn't have a life, just work and not even be able to provide for my children's because I was living for, with my, my parents at the time, like I mentioned, but I would get regular customers that would come in from the community college. So they were like counselors and um, professors and one of them in particular like would talk to me a lot and he was just like what are you doing with your life um, and I was like well this is it because I like my Marina I went to Marina Valley High School and they did not invest in in our like in us going to like beyond high school so I didn't know it was possible and I'm high, I'm a first generation college student too so I wasn't surrounded by higher education like it wasn't in my vocabulary didn't know it was possible I thought that you graduate high school, you go straight to the university or you don't go at all. And so I missed my shot. And so then um, I told him that like, well, it's too late for me to go to college. And he was just like, well, what if I told you I was, I was 29 when I went to college um, and I was a single parent with two kids. So basically just mirrored my identities and like what I was going through. Um, and so then obviously like when somebody relates to you then it's, it's easier to connect with that person and see yourself in that person. And he was a, he was a black man too. Um, so it was just like a person of color, you know, same experiences, same type of identities, and he was able to do it. And he was like, well, now, you know, I went to college and now I work as a counselor and I help students realize their potential and it doesn't feel like work to me. And I'm able to be off when my kids were off and I'm able to make $100,000 a year um, and have benefits and all this stuff. So he was like, just come see me. Uh, so I went to go see him and pretty much like, you know, he laid it all out for me. I was going to be making more, um, actually pursuing higher education, um, working on campus than I was making at Subway. And so it was like a no brainer. So I quit Subway um, pretty much a couple weeks later, started in 2012 and he hooked me up with a job on campus. So I was working, basically just going to school just to work and then get, you know, get my academics in order. Um, I didn't know I was gonna transfer at first cause I didn't, like I said, uh, first generation, didn't know about the whole process, but he taught me about it and um, not like he had ill intentions, but he actually like, he thought that I needed support, which I did. You know, my parents uh, did support me while I was going through, uh, going to community college with watching my kids. So I didn't have to pay for childcare um, and all of that, like, you know, financially. So he was like, he basically did my ed plan to like put me to UCR or San Bernardino. There's nothing wrong with Cal State San Bernardino or UCR, 
but it was because it was local. And so I didn't think I was, you know, I had the potential to go to UCLA, um, but it wasn't until I met another person and um, she's my mentor to this day, but she's a counselor now, she wasn't at the time, but she did tell me, she was like, you got a 4.0 GPA and you need to do this, this and that, like you need to get involved, you need to, you know, um, you're a parenting student, like you have a lot, you're working, you're doing all this stuff, you just have to highlight that you could get to UCLA if that's where you wanna go. Cause she actually asked me like, where do you wanna go? Um, and I have, I didn't ask, I didn't, I wasn't asked that before. So I didn't know, I like, I'm like, oh, you're the counselor, you know, just, you don't ask questions. You just, you know what you're doing, go ahead and send me wherever uh, you think I could go, but that's not the case. Like, if you want to go to UCLA, then you could go to UCLA. Um, but she believed in me. And so I was able to get on that path and I transferred to UCLA. So my experience is pretty, it was pretty good, but yeah, there was definitely some challenges and struggles along the way, but it makes you a stronger person at the end of the day. Thank you for all of your responses. We're gonna go into the, second, the next question. So how would you say that you all navigate school, work, home, family? Like what, what is the secret? Like, tell us about it. So something I'll never forget that I learned at my community college by the, um, the counseling dean at the time, who's now the vice president at, um, at Long Beach Community College. He's also a single parenting student and he got his PhD and now works at USC. So he's, he's very, um, he's the example I look up to. And he told me there's no such thing as balance. And that's when I was starting school, I was a community college student. Now that, you know, I'm a master's student, I realized how true that is. You know, everyone says, oh, you're supposed to balance everything. But if as a single parenting student, um, that's kind of hard to do. Rebecca knows that after, after classes and work, I'd go home and stay up late and trying to maintain that 4.0 so I can be a competitive PhD student. I wrote a 25 page thesis paper just um, because actually as an undergrad, you can apply to a master's dual PhD program, but you do need like a writing sample. It doesn't have to be a thesis paper. So, um, so yeah, I did that and I burned myself out, but something I, I learned from the pandemic is tomorrow's not promised. So, and Zoe was with me, my daughter Zoe was with me 24 seven because, um, the kids had remote learning and, um, I just felt even more guilty because I was doing work in school on the computer while she's just occupied with the tv but what can i do you know i need to work so um i tried my best to maintain the balance of navigating school work and home and um yeah you just have to because if, if you don't balance it and if you're you know our priority is our family that's the reason why we make education our priority but i was just um you know going for education is my priority and i'm doing it for my daughter so that's the reason why but no, I needed to make time for her, especially because she's an only child and she doesn't have another play partner besides me. So, um, so yeah, I had to learn how to um, integrate three things in my life. Um, a, um, air, I learned this, it's called air, A for aspiration. Um, when I'm aspiring to be a psychotherapist. So all that, including education is a priority. I, uh, for integration, integrating time with my family and friends, because um, I wouldn't go out. I just, you know, especially as a young parent, I feel like I neglected my youth and I just was like went straight to school. And my main focus is just to be done. But I need to make time with family and friends and our rejuvenation, air, rejuvenation. I need a rest. I need to sleep. I need to get those eight hours of sleep. I was getting four hours of sleep. Um, but now I have to make it a goal and set an alarm to get eight hours. So that way, when I work, I'm not only more productive, but I can retain the information that I learn. And also, I recommend the job, the part time job you get. I'm assuming um, some, you know, most single parents do have to work. And if you are working a part time job, I was working retail for the longest time, wouldn't get off till I closed the store at 10. I recommend finding a job that leads you closer to your career goal. So my career goal has always been to be a mental health psychotherapist. So right now, one of my part-time jobs is a um, 
student parent representative for a program called Raise the Bar, and we focus on helping single parenting students. And I actually just this week, this this weekend just got um, just got told that I will have a position as a mental health case manager um, available to me. But you see, if I never worked this part time job, um, I could have said no because I'm a full time student and inter I'm, I dedicate my time doing my internships. But I still did it because I needed the money and because I like the cause and the mission. And because I kept it, look, now I already have my career job set. However, if I stayed in retail, I highly doubt it. Um, to add on to a lot of what Brenda said, as far as like the balance, don't even try it. Like that'll make you crazier than actually just living because there's no such thing. Like it's not manageable. It's not attainable. You're not capable of balancing all things. One of the things that I had to let go of is feeling like I could do a hundred percent, be at a hundred percent with every single thing I'm doing at once. Like, no, that was something I struggled with a lot in community college because especially in community college, I had more time. I had more time to do things. I had two jobs in community college. Like I was doing all my classes. I was doing a lot of classes from home. I had a brand new baby and two other kids and I was doing everything. Like all at once. Um, and I was managing. And then once I got to UCLA, I was like, Ooh, I can't do all those things. Like I got to, you know, tailor this down a little bit, like this is intense, you know? And, and then that just continues as you get into like graduate level, as you get into like PhD level, you have to really think about like, what are your priorities? And as Brenda mentioned, like I tell people at this point, unless it's benefiting me in the future, like it has to help me at least two different ways, or I'm just saying no, at this point, I'm just not doing it. And by that, I mean, like, um, for example, I was a graduate student researcher. I still am, but I'm on a hiatus. But for the UCLA Prison Education Program, I saw Santi put that in there earlier. Shout out to Santi on the DJ or whoever's doing it, because I think Cherry might be doing it under Santi. I saw her name earlier. Hi, Cherry, if you're behind there. Um, I want to do that for my PhD. Like, this is what I'm pursuing. This is my population. So it makes sense for me to be involved in this. And yeah, like Brenda mentioned, it's a lot to be working in in our program not only do we have a full-time program, but we also have an internship. So on top of our full-time program, we have an internship. We also have jobs, we have kids. And this, we can't say no to any of these. We can't say I can't do that to anything. But if you're gonna say yes, at least say, I'm gonna get paid. I'm gonna be networking. I'm gonna be pursuing something that is going to help me in my future goal, right? This is piggybacking. And as, as Brenda mentioned earlier, we have a second year placement and we get to interview for our options and I'm going to be working with formerly incarcerated students because of my now my background as a graduate researcher for the UCLA prison education program and because of everything I've done now I'm just kind of like segueing right into that. So when I apply for my PhD programs in the fall, I'm already going to have so much under, you know, so much information, so many resources, so much knowledge under my belt that it's going to be like a no brainer. Like, obviously, obviously you're coming along here. Like, of course you are. Um, and I would just say, prioritize your happiness. That might sound so crazy, but you really have to do that. Like if you find yourself slipping because you feel like you're lacking too much in a certain area, whether that be family time, whether that be academics, whether that be your professional, whether that be yourself, take a break from everything else and focus on that one thing for a second until you're like back to yourself because otherwise you're nothing. Like I cannot be a good parent. I cannot be a good student. I cannot be a good professional. I cannot be a good anything if I'm not here, you know, if I'm not existing, if I'm not fit to even care for people. So make yourself your priority because you can't be there for anybody else or do even be effective for yourself if you're literally not present. And I mean, physically, mentally, I mean, in all ways. So that's something that I had to learn to do. Say no to things that don't make you happy and say yes to the things that do even if you feel like that might sound crazy and you might be neglecting something or other, it will come together as long as you're doing what is best for you and yours. Um, mental health, especially once you start getting to these really competitive academic levels and you're just drained, it's so important to be mentally healthy. Like really, once you, you know when you're slipping, like we all feel it, like, oh, I'm getting to that place where I need to come back, you know, stop what you're doing and come back. Like, don't keep going. And Brenda said, I know, because this is me with Brenda. Like, as long as I've known her, I'm like, Brenda, you're doing too damn much. Like, Brenda's like, that's, I can have a button on her that says that. I'd always tell her, you're doing way too damn much. You need to stop. Like, 
you really need to stop. Like every single morning, we literally carpool together every day. And I'd be like, you're doing too damn much. Like you realize that, right? Um, but it's still manageable. You know, you can still manage without overworking yourself. Like don't set that goal that says like, if I'm not working myself to death, I'm not efficient enough. I'm not productive enough. Like that's a fallacy. That's not real. It's not because I'm chilling right now. Like, and I'm honestly doing better than I've ever done. Like, so when I tell you like focus on yourself and your health and you can be your most productive self and productive doesn't mean like what information are you pushing out? What are you putting on paper? How many letters do you have on your, you know, on your transcripts or behind your name? It's like, how am I being my best self for myself and for everyone else around me? Right. So, um, I say prioritize that yourself and your well-being over everything and everything else will fall into place. So that's my piece on that. Yeah, definitely ditto all of that. Just drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> so I'll just keep mine short because they pretty much covered everything. And I I think I covered it in the last uh, statement that I made, um, but, or my response. Um, Definitely no balance. And I think that I really struggled. I barely started learning boundaries um, and setting boundaries with like schoolwork, whatever. Um, because as, as Brenda mentioned, you, well, what I did was I felt like I prioritized school and work and like just me pursuing higher education for over eight years, because that's how long it took, um, over my kids at times because I was like, but I'm doing it for them. So then in my mind, it was like justified, like, oh, well, I am prioritizing my kids. They are a priority because I'm doing this so that I can, you know, be able to provide for them um, in the long term. But really, like I sacrificed or they sacrificed, I should say, so much time with me. And there were so many several, like several um, all nighters. There were times where I stayed up two days at a time, like didn't go to sleep for two days because I was pushing out research papers or whatever, writing stuff, um, because I was working, you know, they like the grind, but um, I definitely sacrificed and my kids sacrificed a lot of time with me um, that I won't get back now. And so now that I got this new full-time position as a faculty member and I'm more protected um, because I was grinding to get to that level, but now that I got it, then I have learned to take a step back. So when I'm off of work, then I don't like check emails. I don't work, you know, like I'm actually, dedicating time or setting aside time to spend time with my kids because it's been eight years, eight years out of their life that uh, they'll never get back, I'll never get back with me. And so just taking vacations now that I'm able to, you know, afford to do so and just different things like that. So I would say try, I mean, there's no balance, but just prioritize your kids because I mean, you're gonna get this degree or whatever you're pursuing regardless, cause we got, we all have that, that drive and that motivation. Our kids are our motivation to get it done but you're never gonna get that time back um, with your kids. And I, it, that's something that I regret, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I can could, I could make, up, make up what I lost like now. Um, and, you know, it was something that Rebecca said earlier too is where people were saying like, oh, well, I don't see how you do it. I could barely, you know, manage and do this. And you're a single parent, you're doing this and this and that. I used to get that so much too. And I would just, my response is, I have to, like, I have no other choice. I mean, once you're in that position, like it doesn't, I, 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 I can see why people praise it, but at the end of the day, it's like, I have to do what I have to do. Cause I can't just worry about myself. I have these other humans that I'm like raising and taking care of. So like, there's no other option for me. And that's why I do it. And that's why I do it well or whatever, you know? So um, just keep pushing forward. Uh, I mean, everything will align, you know, everything that's meant to be is gonna be for you. Um, just stay focused and stay positive. Thank you so much. I think all of you hit a lot of important themes and topics within the parenting student experience. So I appreciate it because I also see myself related in all of this. And just to close this off and close off such amazing and insightful answers, if there's any one word that you could apply to your experience as a parenting student, what is that one word? How would you describe it in that one word? Or many words. <laughs> um, sorry, I want to say one more thing. <laughs> Dean made me think of a couple more things. Um, with the with the how do we balance? One word for that would be transparency. Sorry, with your children, with your professors, with your peers, with your friends, with everybody. Lifesaver. Like I literally called the lady like, can you pick me up from the airport? Like I've literally helped. Called Zuleika, like, can you help me with my divorce? I literally was like, Brenda, I need a ride from you. These are all 
facts. These are all real things that have happened. Like, and also like, we are each how do I get my kid into the daycare? How do I get this job? Like me and Brenda showed up every single graduate event together. People are like, oh yeah, your friend. Everybody's like, yeah, the one with the red hair. Where you were at every single event. I'm like, yeah, Brenda wants to get in this and I do too. So come on, let's go to every single thing we can together. And that's, you know, huge, but transparency, especially with your children. Like my kids know what I'm doing every second. My kid is on the other side of this wall right now on an iPad because I didn't want him busting in here just for this one second. But they all know, much, you know, they're in my as many classes as they can. They're in every single space with me. So they see like, this is what she's doing when she's not with me. And they're like, oh, this is cool shit. You know, like I'm into it, you know? And they're just very aware because as Dean said, they're so in your, they're a part of this for so like my kids with me through higher education for at least 10 years. They need their, it's them too. Like they're experiencing this journey with me. So they should also be involved and be aware of what's going on and not just like, oh, you're in a dark room somewhere away from me. Like they need to know, like I'm grinding for all of us and you're a part of like, come with me in my classes. Like my kids have been on the campus a million times. That's like, set your kids up like other people do. Like the same spaces that you're in right now from the beginning, like this space is for you too. It's for all of us. So wanted to say that. And so I'm just going to go to the next thing, <laughs> the next one word. So for one word, I would say transformative as my one word, because I mean, I do it. I tried when I was 18. It wasn't for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was not for me. Uh, think about what if I would have done it at that time? It's impossible. I'm supposed to be doing it right now with all these kids baggage with being a single mom, being like, this is when I'm supposed to be doing it. And this is when I could this. So I would say having them to motivate me and to, you know, having, knowing that they're watching me and that other parenting students are watching me, like, you don't have a choice. Like you just have to keep grinding, you know, balance grinding, self-care grinding. Um, I can see um, Rebecca as transformative because since I've known her, she's transformed so much she sets her goals and she she gets them. She wanted a Tesla, she got a Tesla herself. She did that herself. Just like she's getting her PhD. And yeah, and she's very transformative. We all are. And that's the reason why we're all seeking higher education to transform our life to a better life for not just us, but for our kids. Um, so my word would be to breathe in air, as I mentioned before, air. A, balance your aspirations. I, integrate um, with your loved ones. Don't forget that, yes, they're your priority, but make sure your actions show that. And then R, rejuvenation. That's something I had to work on. Rest is air because because um, we deserve rest. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question again? I was going to say transformative and then I like got off. Just whatever one word you would apply to your experience as a parenting student, what would that one word be? Okay, well, it'd be a few words, but uh, I'll say growth and development because I was going to use transformative, but I'll, I'll say something else. And uh, necessary. I don't know. I, I, they, I don't feel like I would have been able to do it without them, you know, because they were my motivation. Like I said, I wasn't motivated to go to higher, like pursue higher education when I was in high school before I had my kids. So I wouldn't be where I am. I love this so much. And thank you for all of your responses and all of the insightful advice that you gave our students. And I just wanna say thank you. And if we could give them a round of applause because they are incredible and inspirational and amazing. And congratulations again on all the bomb things that you guys are doing. And Rebecca, congratulations on that Tesla. I know, right? <laughs> Goals. <laughs> you can do it too, everyone. You can all have a Tesla. Yeah. All you have to do. <laughs> you get a Tesla, fellowship. you get a Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> fellowships everybody get your money and don't feel bad about it I was gonna say I am not you Dean I, I don't feel bad about any you all I feel like you owe it to me reparations now give me all the money I'm applying for every single thing I do not leave money on the table I don't care if I'm not qualified because sometimes you get in anyway last thing I'll leave you with never leave money on the table okay always apply for everything get all the money and never feel bad about it because it's yours okay it's yours to take 
agree. Get it, Rebecca. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm so grateful to have you all. Thank you, Alicia, for moderating that panel. I'm so, so happy to have you all back. Um, at one point, I was all with you. I was part of that first parenting site. Um, and I'm just so happy because it's like full circle kind of a thing. And it, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. Um, but thank you so much. We do have a, a, a couple of minutes left for some questions. So if anyone from the audience um, wants to ask them some questions, we'll take about two questions that they can answer. If anyone from the audience um, has any particular questions for any of our panelists. All right, so we have one question. It says, for those with older kids, tweens and teens, how do you balance being in class when your kid is out of class? Do you send them to the library? Do you take them to class with you? Um, that's a good question. It depends on like timing and what you're doing. For me, I kind of made it so that I would be home when they were home. In undergrad, it's easier to kind of manage your schedule and make it so that your classes, you know, especially if you're early, make it so your classes kind of fit your, your kids' schedules. Most of them will be during the day when your kids are in classes, but you would have to get some type of, you know, childcare for after class if you're talking about school age kids or older kids. Um, for me, I'm like, I'm glad my kids are older, like be home by yourself, you know, like I couldn't wait for my kids to get home. Like I still have a little one, I'm like, be 13 so I can leave you alone. Um, but I have, yeah, my two older kids, like y'all are watching each other, you know, y'all are going to be hanging out or you're going to be coming to campus. I mean, I would be dragging them to campus as many times as I could until they were like, stop, um, we're not going, we'd rather just be home. And then they were just home at that point. <laughs> but my little one, you know, he has to come wherever I go, but my older kids, I would leave them at home, um, or try to do after school or we, with my younger one, I have play dates where we swap a kid every other Friday. It's like my kids over there one week and their kids over here. So we know we're going to have a little break. Like, it's all about like this community. Like we talked about, get you another parenting student friend and be like, I got you on this day and you got me on this day. Like that's your best bet right there. They have all the resources for sure. I don't know if Dean has any, I know Dean has older kids also. So I don't know if Dean has any. Yeah, I do. Uh, so basically the same. I mean, my kids kind of watch themselves now. But when I was at UCLA, they were a little bit younger. So the way my schedule worked was I worked during the day, did class, and I was off by like five o'clock, had to shoot to their school because luckily, so I lived in family housing on the Saltel side, and they went to Clover Elementary. And luckily for me, they had an after school program, which was free, and they keep your kid until six o'clock. So I just had to make sure I got there by six o'clock. So I would just get them um, from school, go home, make dinner, you know, do homework, feed them real quick, put them to bed and then do my work or whatever. So that's how it worked while I was at UCLA. Like I mentioned, when I was at the CC, my, my parents helped me a lot. So I didn't really have to worry about that. And then when I was in my master's program, they're a little bit older so they can kind of stay at home by themselves. But I was commuting for two years. Um, I went to Cal State Long Beach and I lived in Redlands. So it was like, an hour and a half, two hour drive. But I did have family that I would just, you know, leave them with because it was a drive and it was late night. Sometimes I just take them with me to campus. Um, in my grad classes, my daughter was actually participating because she's a social justice advocate. So she would just be participating. I'm like, damn, like I don't even participate that much. But um, so it was good. It's good for them to experience that too because, um, you know, I was first generation, didn't know. Now they know how to get to, you know, higher education and they're like participating in making all this change and all this stuff. And I did see that uh, Brenda reposted a question that was asked. So when I changed majors for psychology, cause, okay, so psychology, as you all know, probably that it is very competitive to get into. And so really the, it wasn't hard for me because gender studies was not impacted or anything when I was there. So that was why I was able to like transition over. But I was also, when I, when I, tra when I transferred, I was psychology major, but then I took on gender studies as a, as a double major. So I was already double majoring in them too. Um, and I dropped psychology, but when I dropped psychology, they were like, are you sure? Like people don't just drop psychology, you know, you got whatever. So I, I had a hard time doing that. Cause I'm like, yeah, like I, it took me a long time to get here and it was really hard, but it, I was sacrificing, like I said, my grade GPA, what I wanted to do with myself and um, in my future and myself, you know, my, my mental health and all this other stuff. So it wasn't hard for me. They were just like, they were just questioning like why I wanted to drop it. Um, but gender studies, like I said, was not impacted, but it depends on the major. Cause some majors you can't do that to. You can't like, 
once you get to UCLA, you can't double major in a certain major. Like psychology, you can't. You have to be accepted into psychology in order to go into psychology. So you would just have to check with the advisors, see what uh, majors are you're able to switch into and um, that whole process. But for me, it wasn't hard. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know there's a couple more questions on the chat, um, but at this point, we're going to go ahead and end it here. Um, you're more than welcome to put your emails there. I know a lot of our students resonated with all of you, Dean, Brenda, Rebecca, you're more than welcome if you feel comfortable that way they can ask you more questions, um, if that's okay. Um, but again, thank you so much for being here. I'm like so happy that you all are here and that you shared so much valuable information. There was so many like head nods. There was so many, yes, that's me. So resonating with what you've been through and also what you're, what, how you've made it better and how you're helping yourself and just your children. So that's going to help our future transfer students here present today. So thank you again. Um, and another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Good luck. Great to see everyone. See you later. Great to see thank you. Bye, Santi. Oh. Hey. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. Good to see everybody. Alrighty. Well, with that being said, we are going to be closing it off. So then that way, all of you can go take a little break, um, you know, process all of this information and get some water, get some food. But first, we're going to do a raffle. Yes, we're having a raffle at every session. Um, so I know that we're ready with with the winner. I know that they were going to go ahead and spin it. Um, so I'm not sure, Alicia or Paola, if you were going to announce the winner. Um, yes, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and spin the wheel. Awesome. All right, let me know if y'all can see that. Yes. Okay, so I'm about to spin the wheel and we are having two raffles today and this is the first one. Good luck everyone. And just a reminder, you will be getting your prize at the end of summer, just when everything is kind of settled, you will be getting your, your, uh, yay, Armini Sarkisian. All right, congratulations to our first winner. And please expect a message from us. And don't worry if you didn't get this first one, we do have another one at the end of the second session. Thank you so much, Paola, and congratulations to the winner. I really do hope you all enjoyed this first session of our parenting webinar. We have so much more stuff coming to you right after break. Um, so come back to the same Zoom. We're so excited to have you for that second part, and enjoy your little break. Um, we're going to keep it the same, so we're, if you can just come back at 1245, we're just going to aim at the same time. So. Session two will start at 12.45 and we will see you here. And I'll go ahead and uh, place a 